The 70s was certainly an eventful time in history, with the first men on the moon in 69, the Cold War between America and Russia, and the war in Vietnam. But almost all of this ceased to matter when the dome was discovered. Encased is an isometric turn-based RPG, and also DCG's first game. Dark Crystal Games is a new independent studio based out of St. Petersburg, Russia. Around 2018, they began a Kickstarter campaign to fund the development of Encased, hitting 120% of their goal. In December of 2020, they decided to partner with publisher Koch Media. They claimed that their partnership would bring full professional voice acting and a wide range of localization, of which the full voice acting didn't end up making it into the game. Early in development, Encased picked up the term Russian Fallout. This came from the many similarities between the two games, even though DCG found inspiration from several other games and even movies. But with the CRPG style, interactions, power armor, and travel in the world map, you'd be hard-pressed to find one it resembles more than the old Fallout titles. However, this isn't some post-apocalyptic world caused by a nuclear fallout, and the timeline actually takes place in the 70s. 1971. We woke up in a different world, where the Cold War ended along with the Vietnam carnage. All because of the dome. The dome. A territory full of anomalous artifacts, phenomena, and organisms. We still don't know what it is. An alien city? Some kind of a testing ground or storage? Whatever it is, no living thing trapped under the dome can escape it. Yet even this did not stop the research. The major powers created the Cronus Mega Corporation to develop and explore the dome. Its secrets became a lucrative business. The Spire Station was built on top of the dome to export the artifacts and import supplies and personnel. The city of Crystal Sands grew at the foot of the dome, eventually becoming a major transportation hub. All this required thousands of employees, and there was no shortage of candidates. Romantics, pragmatists, and adventurers of all trades swarmed recruiting centers around the globe, seeking jobs at Cronus. You were one of those people. In 1976, your application was approved and you went under the dome towards the future. Whether a good one or a bad one, only time will tell. Cronus employed the world's greatest engineers to develop infrastructure and outposts. They constructed the massive elevator that pierced the dome's aperture at its peak, referred to as the spire, which ferried the teams down into the miasma of alien discovery. But this wouldn't be so easy as the dome had defenses of its own. The artifacts would be studied and categorized by the world's most intelligent minds, and then sent to the spire to be hoisted out of this other world and be transported to whichever country bid the most money. Excavation and construction became a round-the-clock venture, so Cronus began the employment of criminals to handle the more monotonous, demeaning, and dangerous tasks. The security branch of Cronus was now meant for more than just fighting off the dome's defenses. They were now the police and jailers. All of this was overseen by the shrewd and virtually unblinking eyes of the administrators. The transportation and allocation of every material, the status and directive of every employee, everything that happened inside the dome was monitored and logged. Cronus had become a world superpower. Countries' reliance on their advanced technologies and artifacts allowed them to essentially dictate their actions lest they be excluded from bidding on these alien wonders. What happened inside the dome was a mystery to everyone, as Cronus wouldn't allow any information to escape. Cronus was a dictatorship, complete with its own class system, referred to as wings or branches. The architects of these modern marvels of engineering are known as the Blue Wing. The brilliant minds in charge of categorization and study of the artifacts are known as the White Wing. The criminals subject to forced labor and experimentation are known as the Orange Wing. Those in charge of protecting and policing those under the dome are known as the Black Wing. And the administrators that oversee everything are known as the Silver Wing. That's about as much as you know before you make your way down the spire and into the dome as a new employee of Cronus. 
but most of what the public was told amounted to little more than propaganda, and what was truly happening in the dome was hardly in your job description. Though Encased is supposed to take place in the 70s, you'll probably forget that immediately until you're reminded of it every so often by either the narrator or NPCs. A lot of the decor does look 70s. The furnishings, jukeboxes, some benches, one poster, and this one classic vehicle. But no one talks or looks anything like it. Well, almost no one. And though I'm young enough to have never seen the 70s or 80s firsthand, I am old enough to know they didn't have flat screen TVs, Wi Fi, or trapdoor automated turrets with an IFF system. I understand they found new technologies inside the dome, but they discovered it in 1971. The beginning of the game takes place in 76. That's an unbelievably quick turnaround rate as far as research and development goes. Unfortunately, in Case's opening gameplay scene, is one of the worst I've ever played. You're in a little box in the middle of a void, and when you go to talk to people and the camera does this, it really doesn't help things. Then the moment you get out of the box, which turned out to be an elevator, you're greeted with a fairly bleak environment. Also, enjoy this moment while it lasts, because this is one of the few times you'll see this many NPCs on screen at once, in the game, outside of combat. Something unfortunate, but it really didn't hurt the experience for me too much even though it does make it feel like you're one of the last people on Earth sometimes. The vast majority of the rest of the game looks much better, so it's really a mystery as to why they chose to make the first two scenes of the game so lame. And this is after getting out of the character creator, where you get to put different shapes of Play-Doh on a jagged model. The graphical quality of this game can be all over the place, though the bad does seem to be very front-heavy. Here's a car cover, now here's the car. Here's a neat poster, here's a JPEG. Here's a nice wall texture, here's a wall texture that they just stretched. Same deal for the ground here. Of course, the good textures and models far outnumber the bad. It's just weird to see so many low-res textures in a game that can also look this nice. The characters looking a bit off is also offset by the fact that you're never close enough to see your character most of the time anyways. It's more their portraits you'll focus on, which, like a true CRPG, they give you a selection of portraits that are just not possible to recreate using the character editor. Eh, close enough. Another thing in my fairly small list of gripes is how buildings cut away for you to see inside. Or rather, how they don't. The roof will fade out, but the walls will stay visible. You can zoom and rotate the camera, but you can't move it up or down. So navigating or exploring buildings, especially small ones, will have you doing constant 360s in every single room to make sure you didn't miss anything or anyone you might want to talk to. The day-night cycle adds a lot of visual appeal to the game. The environments already look mostly very nice, but walking through a town at nighttime with street lamps and fires being the only sources of light adds a lot of depth and complexity to the simple models. It does a lot with a little, which is why this game's recommended specs are also just a 1060. There's several different types of anomalies you'll come across, and they all look serviceable. That's just kind of how it is in Encased. Nothing looks particularly great, but nothing looks bad, except for the bad textures that we talked about earlier. The dynamic lighting definitely helps a lot, but there's a lot of areas where it's either too weak or just non-existent and doesn't add any complexity to the scene, leaving it look too flat or just too clean. But shots like this one here kind of make up for it. It's such a battle between decent and mediocrity. It's either a little better or a little worse, but never really great and never really bad. This extends to the items as well, albeit in a different way. They took care to make the equipped items appear on models, but only sometimes. Some helmets will make your backpack disappear, Helmets that wouldn't clip into the backpack, so not quite sure what that's about. Same happens with some armor and gloves. And I mentioned that this game was made by Russians, right? Because the majority of equipment, vehicles, and some structures in the game look very Russian-esque. Even a lot of the portraits look like Russians. Seriously though, doesn't this mask remind you of Stalker? Or these masks, with the big, heavy, chunky design, looks exactly like something Russians would make. And look at this servo armor and tell me it's not just a Russian version of Fallout's power armor. It's not meant to be disparaging, it's just an interesting fact. But you'll hear Russian tones in the music as well. Unfortunately, the music is pretty weak. I don't mean it's bad, even though it's not really my taste. When I call it weak, I mean it has no punch whatsoever. No presence. It's like a neutered techno. 
It does kind of have a 70s vibe to it, I guess. Maybe they were going for something like Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, with many tracks constant droning or low chorus with random blips tossed in. Some tracks certainly stand out more than others, but not one ever makes it past just being background music. I know not every game can have a soundtrack as badass as Doom or as beautiful as Shadow of the Colossus. But it's well known that music is a driving factor of emotion. So when every single track is a slow techno drone or low drum and bass, you've completely lost one of the few elements a video game has that is capable of pushing a desired emotion. We've already gone over one of the other elements, visuals. So if you take my word for it, you'll understand that this game doesn't do a whole lot in the way of making you feel any kind of way. Which might actually make some sort of sense, I guess. You're just an employee of a company who's forced to do things way out of your pay grade. It's your own immersion into what you're doing that'll sell the experience, not necessarily the premise itself. As far as the sound goes, it's alright. The voice acting is great at its best and a notch above serviceable at worst. There will be a massive amount of repeated lines between characters, and some weapons sound painfully weak, and the lack of dramatic music can leave you in silence between turns in combat and the positional audio is centered to the screen, meaning anything that happens that isn't directly in the middle of your screen is going to be significantly quieter than anything else that is. So a non-centered gunshot or attack will be so quiet it sounds like it's coming from the next town over. Then your centered character will grunt so loud that it scares the shit out of you. I didn't even hear it. The ambient noise is usually perfect for the area you're in. It adds a lot of needed immersion and just noise in general.
The combat soundscape can be a bit on the awkward side due to some factors that don't play nice with the turn-based combat. Some weapons, as I said, can sound fairly weak, coupled with the very small proximity of the sound effects, constantly repeated phrases, and the lack of prominent music, making the time in between actions fairly silent aside from any area ambient noise. That's certainly not all of the encounters though. Plenty of weapons sound beefy, sometimes they go pretty quick and there's not much dead air at all, or there's just enough going on to fill the void. You're dead, asshole. Ow. Ow. From justice in the orange wing, now I judge you. <laughs> Come on, stop it! you to be humble now. You want a fist fight? Respect. Good old fashioned fist fight. The main draw of Encased is exploration, and I'm being very serious about that. There are no objective markers in the game world. There is when you're in the travel map, but a lot of the areas are so big or made up of so many different areas that you're going to have a hell of a time finding out who it is you're supposed to be talking to, or where it is exactly that you're supposed to go. I've seen a lot of people express their anger with the lack of objective markers, and I guess I can understand that some people do expect a certain amount of hand-holding in games nowadays. If the game isn't entirely linear, then there will be a big arrow showing you exactly where to go and exactly what to do. Without those, some people really are hopelessly lost. But as a fan of the classic RPGs like Fallout 2 and Morrowind, no objective markers was a refreshing change of pace. One that almost entirely made up for the game's shortcomings. Why adventure games have almost completely removed the adventure part of the genre by always telling you where to go and what to do is beyond me. But a fog of war filled map, basic directions, and a whole lot of where the hell am I added a sense of wonder to the game that it wouldn't have pulled off otherwise. This word has come up a lot, but when you ask what encased gameplay is like, the most accurate answer is just Fallout 2. Even the devs admit this. It does have its own concepts and iterations on the genre. It's not an exact copy, but it's pretty damn close. First up is the character creation. You can pick a pre-made character, like however the hell you pronounce that, or you can be a normal person and create your own. We've already gone over the lore of the branches, or wings of Cronus, and you can see that they all have their own starting bonuses, but you can make any type of character you want out of any chosen branch. They're pretty much solely used to dictate some story and conversations. The attribute selection shows you everything they affect, along with an explanation and the formula used to calculate it. You'll never have to look up a guide to see how to get to a certain build. It's all right there the moment you start the game. One oddity that you'll notice is the Psych attribute. We'll go over the lore of this later. But just know that the dome has awakened psych potential in living creatures and unliving too. Abilities are picked up every 30 points in their respective category up to the final ability at 150 points. Some of these are passives and others are either worthless or very situational. But there's plenty of special attacks and debuff abilities as well. There's also some cross effects. When having enough points and two different abilities, you'll be able to use both of them in the form of a different ability or what have you. 
Oddly enough, with as much information as they give you about attributes, there's a lot of sub-abilities that aren't listed here and have no information as to how or what improves them. For instance, lockpicking. Nowhere in the game can you find a lockpicking skill, what level it is, or how to improve it. The only time you ever even see it is when you're trying to lockpick. There's a lot of these, and it never ceases to be confusing every time I encounter a new one. However, there's also some crossover in some abilities. For example, while you could use lockpicking to open a lock, you can also use strength to just outright destroy the lock. There's also some skill books and magazines that you can use to temporarily increase some ability scores to help you do things like hack computers or pick locks, among other things. Last up in the creator is the traits. These are essentially perks in Fallout terms, except there's far less useful ones, making them more quirks than anything. You get access to new traits by allocating the prerequisite amount of points in certain abilities. There's some that sound really cool, but end up absolutely fucking you over. For instance, the trait that allows you to not use any action points to reload your weapon. Instead, it just gives you a bit of fatigue. Fatigue isn't too big of an issue in the early game, but later on, psych users have the ability to outright insta-kill you if your fatigue gets to be too high along with all the debuffs you get for being tired. After you finish your character, you'll see that you do have to look out for your hunger, thirst, weight, and rest or fatigue. I imagine you fully understand that being thirsty, hungry, overweight, or tired will affect your stats. The more advanced the condition, the greater the penalty, but it does go a bit further than that. For example, being tired will also reduce your initiative. Your initiative determines the order of turns, so the lower it is, the further back you get placed in the turn order. Should you be in the penultimate stage of encumbrance, there's no doubt you will be the last in the turn order. And the final stage of exhaustion is your character passing out and you having to either hit them with some energy or sit and stare at them sleeping on the ground until they've rested enough to get back up. And yes, this can happen in combat. If your last character on their feet passes out, it's counted as a death. As I've stated many times, this game is Fallout 2 in the gameplay sense. It's an isometric, turn-based RPG set in a localized, post-apocalyptic alternate timeline. You can have a small party, up to three characters, with one being your created character and your choice of two companions you'll have to find in your travels. These companions have a reputation system, which is influenced by your actions. For example, some are fine with breaking into things, others get really mad about it. Your reputation with them dictates dialogue options and how they see you. The factions of the dome operate on a similar reputation system, though what they like is you doing things for them and what they dislike is you doing things against them. You'll end up interacting with all the factions in one way or another because of the story, but some companions you'll have to seek out yourself. There's a massive amount of exploration that can be done in the game. A lot of areas will be found due to quests, but there's plenty of random events you'll come across just traveling. From random people found out in the middle of nowhere and mobile trading posts to much more violent events. While walking around, you'll realize pretty quickly that it takes a long time to traverse some of the areas you'll find yourself in. A lot of these areas are huge, which is fine when you're exploring somewhere, but when it comes to towns, everything is very spread out. Even this isn't necessarily a problem, but they're also sparsely populated. Some towns will have maybe a handful of NPCs in view, while in others, you'll only ever pass one or two on your way down the path to a specific building. Like I said, it makes you feel like you're one of the last people on Earth. There's an event that happens early in the game that could explain why there's so few people, but these towns all have governments of sorts, power structures, sending out convoys and expeditions. Where the hell are they getting all these people? Where do they live? Not all establishments are like this, Magellan Station specifically. It has many floors, but since it's all one building, everything is nice and close together, which means the small population still has a high density, making it feel almost overcrowded. I much prefer the high density, and I think it would have added a lot to the game if they added a lot more ambient NPCs. Keep in mind what I said earlier about the lack of prominent music and combine that with walking through a ghost town. Aesthetically, it leaves a lot to be desired. Uh... 
During your exploration, you'll encounter some shortcuts. These are usually in the form of places you can attach a rope, if you have any, so you can climb up. Also, zip lines and places where you can just jetpack to the area instead of taking the long way around. There's many other useful items that can help you along your way, and even though you have a limited carrying capacity, you might want to try to keep at least one or three of them with you, even though these are very few and far in between. Combat is a bit of a mixed bag. Some fights were actually really difficult, required a few restarts, and were actually pretty fun. Others were really boring, took way too long, and happened way too frequently. But for the most part, this is a story-based game, so combat is just kind of filler. Especially since the combat is pretty much nothing past moving into range and firing at enemies, just like the old Fallout games. There's no cover system, so it really is that simple. Abilities can cause status effects and the like, as I mentioned earlier, but if your weapon's range is 6, move to that distance and just click on the enemy when it's your turn. Easy as that. Honestly, even the status effects are kind of weak or lame. The only time I ever used anything that wasn't just my basic attack is when I just so happened to have enough action points left over that I could afford one. It's worth mentioning that I played the game on the classic difficulty, one notch below the hardest. There were some encounters thrown at me that I wasn't even close to being ready for, and no amount of save scumming was going to help me. I was forced to go do more stuff and level up, which was actually a positive. I do have a bias for games that don't level up the enemies with you. They just stay what level they are as gatekeepers for the harder areas. It forces you to go experience more of the game instead of just flying through things, and I wasn't aware at the time that I was getting too far ahead. So I went back to find more quests, and that's actually when I found another one of the companions, one that I ended up keeping with me for the rest of the game. Companions, like pretty much every other RPG, can be controlled and outfitted by you. In this case, they do have a weapon that is unique to them that you cannot remove, but it is upgradable and they can become some of the strongest weapons in the game. They do have a second slot for another weapon where you can give them whatever you want anyways though. One thing you can't do with them is choose their stats and traits when they level up. They have their own preset path. This doesn't become a problem whatsoever. Your companions can do everything you can do. So just because you can't do something due to low skills, if they do have that skill, they can. For instance, with my first playthrough, I didn't have strength or lock picking skills, so I couldn't open any locked doors or locked containers. I did have a companion who mained strength. This meant that he could kick open the doors and break any locks we came across, along with any other scenarios that required strength, like moving beams or junk out of the way to open up a shortcut or blocked off area so I never had to worry about either of those skills. Couple that with the fact that you can have two companions, and you'll have a team equipped to do damn near anything. Getting back to the combat, specifically the enemies, there's a good bit of variety here. With the humans, all different factions have fairly different equipment, though mostly the exact same attacks. The creatures are where it starts to get weird. First and foremost, the radiation in the dome has awakened psych abilities in some living and not living creatures. This is what gives psych users their powers, but it also led to horrible mutations among some creatures in the dome. Up first are the necroids. Take a normal person, add a bunch of tumors, and give them radiation-induced elemental powers and immunities. These guys hit like a truck and can take a beating. They're often used to punctuate areas as mini-bosses, though you'll find weaker variants acting in a sort of commander role for some groups of enemies. The first one you're likely to fight is going to give you a very inaccurate view of their lethality. Even with two companions, the majority of times I had to avoid an area because the enemies were too strong, these were the culprits. Like when they put more than one of them in the same room as this big bastard. This is one of the AI defenders of the dome, a Mobius. Not too terribly much is known about these except for the fact that they're really good at ripping people to pieces with their blades and blasting them with elemental attacks. Or, at least, that's what's said about them. Oddly enough, they're made out to be these super death machines, but I have had far more trouble with necroids than I have ever had with them. Even though they also have immunities and look as if they should be able to eviscerate your entire party without a problem. They do have decently strong melee attacks and AoE ranged attacks, but since there's almost always only one in any given fight, save a few, I've never had a problem with them. And speaking of robots, Kamikaze Robo Kids. 
where do I even start with this? The fact that you can get one as a companion that calls you Senpai. Social mode. Senpai, I'm ready. We can talk to Akira. And wears a schoolgirl's outfit. Or the fact that they're fucking suicide bombing robo kids. The hell is going on over there in Russia? Well, we're still playing encased, so the combat is still limited to them walking into range and attacking you. So there's nothing too crazy here, aside from the kamikaze ones that just blow up on you after attacking and dealing a lot of damage. But I did... Robotic children. Jesus. And it doesn't end there. Just like almost all isometric RPGs, you'll have to fight creatures such as rats and cockroaches. A tradition that I really wish would die because it's stupid. But there's another animal on the roster. See this hyena? No, wait, sorry. This hyena? Yep, that's a cannon on its back. We just, uh, we just have those. The non-cannon clad canines, like all creatures in the game, can also have elemental powers, because it wouldn't be a Russian fallout without hyenas creating AoE clouds. Don't underestimate them. The hyenas travel in packs, sometimes scripted hordes, and they'll wear you down with sheer numbers. Never mind their decent attack damage. Some of them have less lethal shotguns on their back and will constantly fire fatigue-inducing rounds at you that, of course, have AoEs. At some point, you'll get a quest that will reward you with a servo suit, basically Fallout's power armor. It'll start off busted up, but you can repair and upgrade it with fairly expensive materials. You'll only ever get one, but the pilot ability tree adds a lot of extra bonuses when using it. One small but understandable annoyance is that there's some actions you can't do while wearing it, like crawling through small openings or up ladders. You'd think that maybe they'd put enemies in these locations that would actually force you to remove your armor for some reason other than just being a minor annoyance, but that only ever happened to me once, plus the enemies were avoidable and it was a shortcut rather than the only way to a certain area. Encased is one of those games where it's all about the journey rather than the destination, especially since the ending is directly impacted by what you did in the game. It's the sum of your actions, just like, for the hundredth time, Fallout. It doesn't matter what branch of the company you pick, everything still ties into what you did in the dome. So don't worry about one branch having some massively new experience. There'll be some new dialogue, and of course your build will probably change the gameplay up a bit, but all rivers lead to the ocean. You can help out any or all of the factions, but there are some scenarios in which you're going to have to make a choice. Faction A, B, or neither. Choosing Carmine Heights over Phalanx will likely hurt your relations with them, but there's often extra things you can do in those situations that can either mitigate or exacerbate love lost. In most cases, you'll decide whoever you like the most and try to assist them in every way you can. However, you can also just not. Just sticking to the main quest line is a viable option. After you get to the dome, you'll be immediately selected for a special assignment, because of course you will. Something goes horribly wrong and it's basically the end of the world, because of course it is. Except by the end of the world, I mean just the end of the inside of the dome. This is where the real adventure begins, and when you're going to acquaint yourself with the new political groups that have sprung up to take power. The main factions you're going to come across the dome and who you'll have to interact with at some point are the new committee. These guys are basically the bastard child of Cronus, or at least like the remnants. They still stick to the company policies in a tyrannical fashion, instead of the employer they now see themselves as the rulers, in at least so much as to bring order to chaos. Should someone go against them in some way, they'll either end up in a cell or banished, which, since it's the end of the dome, likely means death. The Phalanx has the strangest backstory to me. They're essentially a private military organization with well-disciplined and equipped soldiers that adhere to a military-like hierarchy. The strange part is that they weren't created by the Black Wing, the military guys. They were created by the Orange Wing, the criminals. When a bunch of thieves and murderers break out of their constructive prison, the last thing I'd think they'd do is create a professional military. Regardless, they're looking for any way possible to expand their power and influence, though they don't seem to be doing it with their firepower. Again, the criminals have militarized, ran training drills, and they're so well disciplined that they won't use their new guns to rule those weaker than them. That makes no sense to me, but moving on. Carmine Heights was created by the Blue Wings, the engineers that were fed up with the Cronus Remnant's leadership. 
They wanted freedom, so they went out and found themselves a nice place to build their own settlement and then built a wall around it. While that might sound based as f the wall was erected because they're scared of everything, especially phalanx. You know, the criminals that refuse to use their guns to take whatever they want. And speaking of people taking what they want, we have the FOPs. These are that group of sociopathic bloodthirsty raiders that every post-apocalyptic game has. Unlike those other games, instead of comically evil, they're comically retarded, literally. The event that caused all of this chaos also dropped their IQs to that of children. Their goal in all of this is to checkmate everyone. I don't know what that means. And the developers themselves claim that even the fops don't know what that means. When they're not running around and playing like school kids, they're butchering caravans for their supplies. The Church of Adam, or uh, sorry, the Church of Maelstrom. They're your typical end of the world church, trading food, water, and shelter for new recruits that they'll indoctrinate into mindless zealots. They run off the idea that the tragic event responsible for all this mess was actually a good thing. And if you do as they say, you'll reach some version of paradise. And with a million unexplainable holes in a story that makes no sense, you better believe people buy into it. Finally, we have Picnic, the dump stat of factions. They're completely neutral, and apparently everyone's okay with that. They have no ambitions or goals aside from leaving everyone alone and vice versa. But that doesn't mean they won't defend themselves. Each has something you need to complete the main quest. But their settlements are also the main places you'll go to get side missions as well. But now it's time to get into the story itself. If you don't want spoilers, skip to this timecode. After you finish the training in your very first 10 minutes inside the dome, you're pulled aside and given a special assignment by the chief officer of Magellan Base, Martin Kingsley. He gives you an abridged but true version of what's happening inside the dome how it's neither a treasury of technologies nor a cemetery of the ancients. After his drama and intrigue-inducing lore dump, he gets to the mission. Nashville Station, a fully staffed and important installation, has completely gone dark. Kingsley sent a reconnaissance team to go and investigate, and now they too have lost all communication. So, since potentially several hundred people are now MIA, he wants you, the person that just got off the elevator, to go find out what's going on alone. Because RPGs are kind of like horror movies, and incredibly stupid decisions like this are apparently the only way they can exist. At least for the vast majority of them. You go to the garage, which is conveniently right next to the comlink room, and meet Clara Morgan, the person that will drive you to the mission area. The vehicle's radiator overheats, which is the immediate concern, but there's also been a large storm brewing that has effectively cut off access to Nashville Station. Luckily, you broke down in the neutral zone, also referred to as Picnic, because they just so happen to have a tree anomaly which produces artifacts that can shield a vehicle from a psionic storm. Well, that's deus ex machina. I mean, lucky. Have a literal picnic, grab the artifact, and be on your way. When reaching Nashville Station, the automated turrets open fire on you. This moment is actually awesome on a gameplay level. When the turrets open fire, you get several different branching options. If you choose the option that you gain from your death-proof trait, Carla will be shot, and you'll crash somewhere in the middle of the facility's parking lot. If you don't choose that option, you can have her stop and neither of you will be hurt. A game that gives you special abilities that can actually be worse than the normal route blew my mind. That might sound like I'm overselling it a bit, but it's one of the little things this game does that makes it rate higher to me than it normally would. Trying to show off can very well get you killed, or at least get someone hurt. So you'll abandon the vehicle and find alternate means to get inside. Creepy. Among the bodies of the dead, you'll find several staff members wandering around with glowing eyes and mumbling in some sort of fugue state. You'll come across Luis Decker Schultz, a throwaway character meant for a little more than another lore dump. You'll be able to ascertain this immediately, since she doesn't even warrant a voice actor. Her purpose is to tell you that she's part of the reconnaissance team, and that when they entered the station, they were pointed to the third floor to presumably help fix the communication systems, except there was a mob waiting for them that rushed and killed one of them, and then started eating the corpse. Everyone more or less scattered, but she and the doctor, Ronald Steele, ended up in this room. She knew Steele was going mad, so she locked him in the other room. 
She may be in shock or an extremely early form of PTSD, but her mannerisms implicate that she may be going mad herself. You speak to Steele and learn that he and a colleague were aware of the glowing eyes and that they weren't an autonomous phenomenon, but a link in the chain of symptoms that's causing people to go crazy. This facility is in a kind of bubble of radiation, apparently coming from a relic down in the caves of the excavation zone below the facility. You all make your way down there to shut down the artifact, coming across a large number of the station's inhabitants, all in a docile fugue state. After a series of button presses and lever pulls, you approach the relic and begin the process of shutting it down. But your success is met with extreme consequences. The relic and its power explodes into the storm, and you are ripped from your physical body and mentally transported atop the maelstrom. You perceive the destruction of the storm as it raises the lands inside the dome. You see lights alone and in groups actively moving, quickly, almost as if each light were a person, and time was advancing at incredible speed. The maelstrom began to settle, receding back to its original diameter, and you appeared in a metaphysical form standing just above it, where you see others, some faces familiar and some not. The form you're assuming, while similar to the others present, you can tell by speaking to them that they're not here. Rather, you're speaking to them through their thoughts. They can see and hear you, but are somewhere else far away. Through their comments and surprise in seeing you, you'll gather that the maelstrom did indeed reap hell among the dome's inhabitants, and many people were lost. But also, that some amount of time has passed. You'll awaken back inside your own body, next to the now-destroyed relic holding apparatus. Two years later. You collect yourself and exit the cave. You'll come across a small group of goggle-clad mindless thralls, people who had lost their minds to the Maelstrom's radiation, just like the people you saw inside Nashville Station, except these are organized and use weapons. You'll dispose of your assailants and leave the premises, and from here you're open to explore the dome however you want. We'll focus solely on the main quest line, else this video is going to be… well, here's the amount of footage I have. I trust you'll understand. Where we'll head first is the Junktown slums. After speaking to several people around town such as the Church of Maelstrom Reverend and the guards blocking access to the council, as well as picking up two companions, you'll end up in the Emulator Project. Here they're working to study the Maelstrom. They keep people that are going through some form of the Maelstrom's mind-altering effects. They want to understand what's happening. And to that effect, the project director, Henrietta Russo, is overseeing the construction and use of the emulator, a device whose name is self-evident of its purpose. Keep in mind, Maelstrom may be a storm, but it's also one of the dome's AI. AI can be programmed and understood. The project's mission. Russo questions you, skeptically, about your exposure to the maelstrom, in almost disbelief with your answers. She checks your vitals, amazed that your brain hasn't turned to mush from the exposure, even though it was higher than even the fops. She explains the events as best she can. Long story short, in 1976, the incident started in Nashville. Maelstrom broke free of the excavation zone, destroyed the spire, and killed a lot of people. And those who weren't killed outright had their brains fried into non-existence. If that was an experiment, I'd call it a total fail. Russo raises her head to study the green lights high up under the complex's ceiling with acute fascination. Everybody was in a panic all that year, waiting every day for the end of the world. But Nakamura was able to overcome the disturbances and evacuated the bigger part of the survivors here. She offered autonomy to anyone who wanted it, those from Phalanx and Carmine Heights, and decided that something must be done about Maelstrom in the center of the dome. Thus, the emulator was born. Russo explains that they need things like certain artifacts and materials to complete the emulator, and you've now joined the team to find them, and end this constructive apocalypse once and for all. First, we'll need a pair of modified teleglasses to interact with the emulator. We'll retrieve them from the Church of Maelstrom Reverend preaching right outside the emulator's building. When speaking to him, you'll get to learn a bit about how they indoctrinate their weak-minded members. Putting on their normal pair of goggles, the real world melts away and you find yourself in their virtual, serene 
paradise. If you were too mentally weak to handle the dome as it is now, it's easy to see why you would never want to leave this virtual world. Falling back into reality, you retrieve the modified goggles from the Reverend and then make your way to Magellan to solve the project's power problem. You'll have to answer a questionnaire to gain access to the facility proper, and then you'll be introduced to a whole other bunker worth of side quests. But for the power concerns, we'll head to the reactor section after getting our servo suit, of course. You'll solve a quick puzzle on the mainframe to get the reactor back into working condition. But that's not the only issue. There's also clear evidence of sabotage. You'll find the man responsible for the faulty fuse, and from here you can choose whether or not to turn him in. But regardless of what you choose, it's time to go to the Maelstrom Observation Camp to get the required drivers being worked on by the team there. You'll find that the research team has been slaughtered, so you'll return the favor to the culprits and then collect what you need. After a rather uneventful collection of the rest of the materials, it's time to return to Russo. They've already run tests and are ready for you to interface with the emulator. After hooking up, you are once again mentally transported atop the storm and speak with Maelstrom itself. Treating it as an AI, you order it to retreat to the center of the dome. Maelstrom reacts immediately, and you are unceremoniously dropped back into your body in the middle of the emulator project's facility. You return to Russo, and she explains that Maelstrom is indeed receding back to the center of the dome as well as routes to Carmine Heights and Phalanx headquarters potentially being opened back up, ending their isolation. Russo is contacted by the chairman, Miss Kamiko Nakamura, and she wants to talk to you. She gives you a formal invitation into the city, wanting you to come and speak to her and the council, while also trying to not so subtly manipulate you. We'll have to meet all the factions to finish the main quest, so we'll accept the council's invitation and make our way to them. Nakamura explains that they're the successors to the Cronus Foundation, having control of the majority of the dome, maintaining order, and alluding to the fact that they're going to be tightening the grip of their iron-fisted policies even more. You'll also meet Ishtwani of the Carmine Heights, Audrey Melville of Picnic, and again, the Church of Maelstrom's Reverend. The cast is basically a bunch of petulant children. Kamiko pretends like she's done everything single-handedly. Ishtwani has to throw in some, nuh-uh, I helped. Audrey has almost nothing at all to add to the conversation and just gives Kamiko sass. And the Reverend only agrees with the notion that you should only be used to serve the project's needs, not for their personal gain which is something they'll all try and do immediately after this meeting. The meet and greet ends and you get back to work. Returning to the emulator project and speaking with Russo, you learn that you didn't actually order Maelstrom away. Rather, Maelstrom recognized that it was within the influence of the emulator, so it reduced its size to protect itself. That doesn't mean you're winning. That means it's an active and intelligent threat. Russo shows you the next step in the plan, planting beacons that will allow you to establish a true link between the emulator and Maelstrom. This plan requires the cooperation of all factions in the dome, including several more materials and a whole lot of being used for political gain. You know, that thing they're not supposed to do. So, once more, into the fray. First, we'll need to speak with Olivia and Johan Reisner, the leaders of Carmine Heights. Olivia is special. She's a conceited, lush, and bitchy wife that only slightly hides her contempt for Johan, whereas Johan is busy trying to make sure he does the right thing for the people he leads. We won't go through their whole bit, I just wanted to make sure I referenced how good the writing is here. It's awkward, sometimes cringy, and provides a decent comedy relief, especially later interactions. It just feels kind of realistic. Finally, speaking to Johan on the Beacon topic, you pretty much get suckered into putting up campaign flyers for his re-election. Because saving the lives of everyone inside the dome is nowhere near as important as him winning his election. And he's certainly not the only one. After being a good little errand boy, you're given the beacons. But that's only the first step. Next, we head to Hieronymus Zemeckis, the leader of the Phalanx, to acquire an all-terrain vehicle for the expedition. However, Zemeckis also wants to win the election in Carmine Heights, so you have to head back and poll the citizens to give him a feel of what people think about him. I swear to God, after completing this simple task, he now has another task for you before he'll give you the ATV, because he's a massive douche. Now he wants you to head to Magellan and use a floppy disk to steal some of their employees' files so he can try and con them into coming to work for him, because well, that will definitely matter if Maelstrom isn't stopped. 
While carrying out this mission, you'll get the chance to completely ruin the data in an undetectable way. I absolutely did that because fuck Zemeckis. Now we end up in Picnic to pick up the anomaly protector that will be used to protect one of the beacons from the storm's radiation. They realize that you can end this nightmare once and for all, so they graciously hand you the anomaly and thank you for putting the weight of everyone's lives on your shoulders. And I'm just kidding. They ask you to put off saving the world for a little while longer because there's a family that was supposed to come join them here in Picnic, and they haven't arrived yet. So there's just no one better to go looking for them than the only person actively trying to save this little slice of the world. Get at it, Dragonborn. After all that hard work, you deserve a rest. Returning to Audrey in Picnic, she now allows you to go into the basement and grab her big brass apples, which is the artifact that will protect the beacon. Next, we return to Kamiko Nakamura at the council in the city to get funds for the expedition. Like everyone else, her stupid problems are far more important than saving everyone's lives, and she wants you to go destroy a bunch of counterfeit Selectrons. If you found your way to that particular facility before you spoke to her and found a disposal certificate there, you'll be able to just hand that to her and pretend like you got it from destroying the Selectrons. That's exactly what I did because, well, I'm sure you can already guess my thoughts on doing pointless air for powerful people that could get literally anyone else to do it and instead just want the hero of the story to do it. But that's not the end of her pointless tasks. She now wants you to go back to Magellan Station and decide who should get the job as the new head of surveillance. I'm pulling hair out at this point. You go and talk to the two candidates and one is obviously just an entitled bitch that tries to bribe you and the other is a well-mannered and serious candidate. It's not a hard decision. Return to Kamiko and get the funds for the expedition. Man, this part of the game is really just falling off a cliff. It gets better, but it could really stand to have some more compelling content than running low-quality side quest level errands as part of the main quest. You have to do this stuff, and they know how to do it better because the next part of the main story gets better, then much better. We'll run across the street and enter the Church of Maelstrom. Following this side story is very entertaining, and there's a lot I wish I could talk about, but for the hundredth time, we're sticking to the main quest line. I had no intentions of assisting these freaks in their pseudo-religious crusade, so I simply kicked their safe door open to steal the implant that we'll need to protect ourselves from the storm's radiation. Yeah, uh, turns out you uh, can't use the big brass apples artifact to protect yourself. That can only be used to protect beacons. Kind of an odd distinction, but whatever. This is where the story has gotten good. Now it's about to get better. We travel to the FOPS camp. The FOPS have intimate knowledge of the surrounding area, and you need to find one that will show you how to get to the position you need to reach to plant one of the beacons. But to get that info, you have to help them win an election. And, no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding, you have to speak to their queen. But to earn that privilege, you'll have to go through the gauntlet, literally. You'll go through an arena full of different teams all fighting to become the queen's knight and trusted representative. Only after this bloody gauntlet will you win an audience with Queen Victoria. However, she won't give you the information you need until you help her win an election. Oh wait, I'm sorry, we're still in the good part of the game, never mind. You've proven yourself, so she'll just give you the information you need. She doesn't actually have direct knowledge, but she does know someone who does, and she knows exactly who and where he is. A man named Sherlock who was exiled by the people from the Northern Citadel into the Maze of Death. Arriving at the entrance of this scarily named and imposing looking labyrinth, you'll be warned by all of those nearby to not go inside, as no one ever returns. I'm not gonna play this up anymore. You'll be massively let down when you walk inside. It's not a maze. Genuinely, it's just not a maze. It's another facility like all the other ones you've been inside of. It's not difficult, it's not convoluted, it's just another building. In fact, the most difficult thing about this maze of death is noticing the guy you're supposed to talk to who blends in very well with the chair he's sitting in, positioned in a dark corner. While talking to him, he says the only way he'll give you the coordinates to the position you need is if you help him win an election. Joking. He just freely gives you the coordinates. He's a nice guy. I even offer to save him from this very complicated maze that no one except my big brain could realize how to get out of. Just don't forget to grab the key off the skeleton in the bathtub. Now we have everything we need and can get to where we need to be with the coordinates provided by Sherlock, which is a location referred to as the First Settler's Camp. 
When you get there, don't forget to equip the implant, else the concentrated radiation is going to cook you alive. You'll have to fight your way through some baddies to get to the site itself, but once you do, you'll place the beacon and attach the brass apple anomaly to it. We'll place the next at the highest point in the dome, the observation deck base, and we'll place the final beacon in the Magellan Station parking lot. Before we continue, I want to impress upon you just how long into the game I am at this point. I've abridged a lot of content, and just laid out the main points of the main quest, but as we walk back into the emulator project to move into the final act of the game, I've been playing for roughly 23 hours at this point. Maybe I'm slow, maybe I'm fast, but don't think what you hear in this section of the video is the only content you'll get out of this game. It's a full RPG, and honestly, a pretty good one. Let's continue on. You interface once more with Maelstrom via the emulator and manage to reduce the harmful psi radiation to a minimum in the location where Russo is planning to set up the expedition's camp. The moment you achieve this, you lose control and are dropped back into your body. When you regain consciousness, you learn that Russo and her team have already set up the camp and the dome's future now rests on your presence. While approaching the mission area to stop Maelstrom, you get a glimpse at the destruction caused by the storm. We finally reach the door. Welcome to Concord. While traversing the desecrated facility, you'll run into many foe and friends alike. If the maze of death was supposed to be an actual maze, then Concord is an endless dungeon. You'll encounter every faction in the dome in these halls, whether you help them or not, and whether they'll help you or not. This is all hands on deck. The deciding moment, the finale. Battling your way outside to the landing pad that holds the transport capsule which will take you to Maelstrom, you'll reach your final obstacle, a meat grinder anomaly, something that holds very true to its name. When it comes down to it, you take a step towards the anomaly. Your companions plead with you to not go any further. You can now decide to ask one of them to step inside the anomaly, or do so yourself. I chose to take the step myself. Moments before the hero is consumed by the anomaly, his companion Crump jumps inside, grabs a hold of him, and launches you both out of its reach. The anomaly, having been disturbed and effectively activated by this stimuli, begins to change shapes and eventually collapses in on itself. You take a moment to address your companions, and then you step onto the transport capsule. There's no emulator. You meet Maelstrom in person this time. There's multiple options, but I simply chose to tell Maelstrom to shut down, and it obeyed. After this, you'll appear standing in front of the doors leading to Concord, back out in the wake of the destruction that had been brought by Maelstrom's psi irradiated storm. Your epilogue can be found by speaking to the people you've met during your adventure, who will be scattered around the surrounding area. Your ending will depend on your actions throughout the game, but as of now, the main story and our work is done. I've been pretty hard on this game, but I really did enjoy it. There were just so many things that were either mediocre or should have been done better, like the combat. I understand that they were going for the Fallout 2 formula, but while that game is great for its time, the combat is very outdated. There's nothing wrong with improving an old system, and when it's one as simple as turn-based, walking into range and clicking on the enemy, there's not much that you could add to that that would somehow make it worse. Even a cover system would have changed the entire meta and made it far more interesting. And things like the music just not quite making the bar. A significant part of the game is traveling, so having something good to listen to does make a fair bit of difference. And that also applies to the lonely exploration and, again, the combat. The story had its ups and downs, but was mostly enjoyable, even though the side quests become painfully sparse towards the mid to end game. The loot was... Alright, the loot is shit. With armor, there's only like one version of everything. So the only choice you have is to pick the one for your class. Same goes for weapons, mostly. There's a bit more variety there, but there's still obviously stronger ones that you're going to end up picking up once you figure out what they are. A lot of items that are used for shortcuts or similar actions are very underutilized because there's only a couple handfuls of places to use them, so they just turn into junk items that you sell to the nearest merchant. The only good thing I have to say about the loot is the crafting materials. There's so many of them and their rarity is, in my opinion, perfectly balanced. With such a low variety of equipment, making the upgrades cost an arm and a leg worth of materials was the right way to go and made each upgrade feel significant. 
The attributes and skills were a little too samey with similar games for my taste, but overall it didn't hurt the experience. And the leveling curve is crazy, where you have the potential to level up almost every encounter in the late game. That definitely improved the combat experience for me. But what really kept me playing, the part of the game I liked so much, was the actual exploration. No giant quest markers telling you where to go. No glowing objects to signal their importance. It's a feeling you just don't get in most games anymore. It can certainly be frustrating, and there were, I think, two different missions I had to look up a guide for. But when they say to go find something, they really mean go find it. Exploring ruins in different locations is true exploration. You don't know if what you need is going to be down this hallway or that one, behind this locked door or down that broken elevator. You can't just make a beeline for the mission, and you can't just go open the glowing box with an arrow above it. You'll have to search and dig and play the game. The varied quests that have you zigzagging all over the dome, and more often than not finding something new and interesting all by yourself, amplified this enjoyable aspect to an even higher degree. But that also can't be the only element. Just not having quest markers doesn't automatically make a good game. There has to be more there. And while the combat was lame and the world could sometimes be dull, there were enough to push it over that bar. Some of the places you'll come across look great, despite the camera angle. Some of the fights you'll have will be entertaining and difficult, despite the simplicity. Some of the moments will be tense or scary, despite the lack of compelling music. Encased still manages to pull off some fun times, even with all of the serviceability and mediocrity weighing it down. Is it a perfect game? <laughs> no. But if you enjoy adventure and a decent story, it really is worth a try. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a like and a comment. If you want to see more like this, subscribe to the channel. Links to the Patreon and the Discord are in the description below. This is Mitchell Godsend. Have a good one.